Amazing. Hi. The moment everyone has been waiting for. I see the chat going wild. <laughs> I'm hello, thrilled, hello. Thrilled to welcome, for those of you who don't know her, the award-winning journalist Noor Tagore to the virtual stage. So welcome, Noor. I'm so honored to be here. And what an amazing group of women to follow up. It, this conversation is going to be amazing. Your career is so impressive. At the age of 27, you've already earned international recognition as one of New Media's most impactful voices. You famously put U.S. sex trafficking under the microscope in your documentary and subsequent podcast series sold in America, and you continue to use storytelling to highlight subcultures and share the perspectives of marginalized people within, within the world. Now you're embarking on an exciting new podcast series under your own production company, at your service or AYS that goes beyond the highlight reel and delves into the mindsets of some of the world's most fascinating people through insightful interviews. I'm so excited to chat with you about your career and the incredible work that you're doing. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk. I'm so excited to talk to the audience and get to know what everyone is thinking right now, what they're grateful for and how we can be of service. Amazing. So there's so much I wanna to talk to you about. So let's just dive right in. Um, you're one of the most exceptional storytellers of our generation, um, end of sentence. And I'm beyond, <laughs> beyond inspired by your culture pushing interviews and your documentaries and your podcast. When did you know that this style of journalistic path was for you? Did you, was there like a particular moment where you knew that you wanted to be a storyteller or particularly an activist? I'm actually, uh, kind of binging my childhood home videos right now. And I'm watching videos of myself from the age of five and sometimes younger, directing my parents and telling them how to interview me. So the interview gene and the documenting gene has always been in me. Um, my dad is like holding the, the, the camera and asking great questions and narrating what's happening. And he was doing that with the intention of sending these VHS tapes back home uh, to his family in Libya, but it ended up being like a perfect documentation of, of what it means to uh, report and tell stories and ask questions. And I'm so grateful that I had the support and encouragement to be able to continue doing that, but I didn't even know what the term journalist meant until I was about 12 or 13 years old. And my dad told me, he's like, this, the thing that you want to do is this. Um, but I liked that you asked about the style of journalism because I've gone through different growth spurts with that style of journalism. I went the traditional route. I went to journalism school. I studied broadcast journalism, but every single one of my professors was a white man, except for one who was a woman of color and she taught journalism in the Middle East and North Africa. And the way that I was taught journalism, I'm now realizing was a bit problematic, more than a bit. And it wasn't serving the communities that I had the intention of serving the way that I wanted to. And I had to change the way I was telling stories to do that. And I was really nervous about doing it because I thought I was already dealing with this insecurity of people telling me that I couldn't possibly be objective because I was wearing a hijab. And so therefore that negated any objectivity that I could actually carry. And also realizing that this identity that I carried allowed me to be the storyteller I am because I knew the impact of misrepresentation in the media and how it, how it affected our communities. And I made sure before I went into any story that I would ask myself, how is the way that I cover this going to impact the community or the people that I'm talking about? And that was a question that I didn't learn in school, but it was one I developed because I saw the harm that was done to so many people. It's really interesting. It's an interesting perspective. And I think, you know, you, when you said you didn't know what journalism meant as when you were younger, it's interesting because from our perspective, you're redefining what that word means um, with your style and with that empathy, I think you have for, for your audience. Um, so thanks to your powerful storytelling, you're an activist, social icon, you have over half a million Instagram followers. Um, how do you view your influence in this space and how do you view social media um, in terms of raising your message to the masses? Mm. 
That's a tricky one because I got on social media. The reason I got on social media originally was actually because I was always using my mom's Facebook to check out like my friend's profiles. I never wanted to be online. And when I did get Facebook and I got social media in general, I wanted to use it as a platform from the beginning. This was when I was in high school. So I came up with these things called good deed opportunities and we would my family has a foundation called the ICU Foundation. We work to alleviate homelessness in our community. And we've been doing this work since I was 12 years old. So I thought it would be a great way to start raising money and figure out who was in need and who needed our help that, so that we could bring people together to be of service to those people. And from that, I mean, I built this awesome, amazing community. I mean, I've gone through tough times in building community because I think the more attention that you get, the more just criticism that you get or hate that you get or just this negativity that isn't why you got on here to begin with. Um, but now I feel really grateful for the community I have, but I do have a problem with <laughs> social media and the way that we are pushed to serve an algorithm and not serve our communities. And I'm, and I'm struggling with that. I'm experimenting with new social media apps that use things like blockchain or uh, don't have an algorithm or don't have discoverability or whatever it is because I just I really my intention of being on this platform is to share these stories is to share more about my journey and directly talk to people so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have those platforms and I'm also looking forward to how we can get more intimate on the internet with the communities that we are cultivating. I like that approach very much. Um, and it's interesting because to your point with the algorithms, it makes it hard to spread an unbiased message inherently in a sense. Um, yeah. But I think that, you know, the world is watching kind of how you, how you, what, what move you make next to connect with that community. Um, so I wanna talk about one of your early projects, um, which was the documentary series Sold in America. It took an investigative look into the sex trade in the US. Um, so what pulled you towards that project at the beginning and that topic in particular? So I typically end up choosing stories that I need to see or I need to hear, but I haven't gotten a chance to. Sold in America is one of those stories I experienced my first instance of sexual violence when I was 12. And shortly after that, a few years after that, I saw Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wu Dunn on Oprah talking about their book, Half the Sky, which covered sex trafficking. And I had never known about this concept or this idea or this just terrible thing that happens in our world where people are exploited in this way. And I remember hearing the stories that they were writing about and thinking to myself, I absolutely cannot imagine or fathom this experience. And I know how much mine traumatized me and it was nothing on near that level. So it started with, I'm going to use this experience that I had of sexual violence to serve a community that I can serve and, and, and use that care that I had and that fire that I had in me. So when I got into college, I started writing papers about it. My first local TV story that I ever did was interviewing a survivor of trafficking. And I started studying this so much and I thought I had it all figured out, but I didn't. And I realized that once we got on the ground and we started reporting that there was this whole other side to the story that wasn't often reported on. And that was the full spectrum of the sex trade. So yes, while sex trafficking exists, sex work also exists and survival sex also exists. And we don't talk about those things and the nuances of those things because the policy that impacts sex trafficking also impacts people who are engaging in sex work and survival sex. And that ends up doing more harm than we'd like. And I realized that there was, uh, that, that part of the conversation was often omitted because our society has this, uh, this desire to control other people's bodies and what they do with their bodies. And so we end up making policy that hurts the way that people get to choose to use their bodies. Very true. And I think, you know, what, what you said about finding that 
finding the the story that wasn't being told. You know, there's in order to understand what drives the sex trade in the U.S., we need to understand the economics that drive it, and kind of putting the spotlight on that first. Um, so last year, just before the first COVID lockdowns went into effect here in the U.S., you launched your own production company, which is called At Your Service. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Um, but what was the catalyst for that decision, and what stories are you hoping to share and tell through that platform? Wow, thank you for asking that. So At Your Service was birthed out of frustration. I had bad experiences with agencies I was signed with. I was trying to share and report on these stories, but uh, people always had a, an opinion about how they should be reported on, or we want a little bit of this, but not too much of that. And this makes us too uncomfortable. And essentially I was just tired of shape shifting into forms that made other people comfortable and wanted to openly create the stories that I know needed to be told, but also support other people who want to tell stories that they feel very passionately about and that they have seen haven't been serviced yet. At Your Service comes from, I actually, while I was doing Sold in America, I got into this very um, low place as one does when they work on something like this, but haven't fully healed from their own experiences and ended up going to a self-care retreat. And it was about refining your core, refining your heart. And it was so life altering. The people who are organizing it would frequently say that like, they would frequently say at your service or they would run to be of service to you before you could be to yourself. And it made me really uncomfortable. I hated it. I didn't understand why they were it just, you know, it felt like when you go to Chick-fil-A and they say my pleasure and then you're like, are they making you say this? Why are you saying this? Is it really your pleasure? And um, I saw that they actually meant it. It really changed my heart and it made me realize that telling stories is a form of service. And the stories that have been told that have penetrated my heart have really, I have thanked to those people who have told those stories because I felt like it was a service to me. So I really loved this idea of intention-based storytelling through a lens of service, because if we choose to tell stories through that lens, then I think the impact just becomes so great. That's beautiful. The power of story. And then under the podcast, Nor, you interview interesting people about all of the ups and downs behind their accomplishments, not just the highlights the good stories, the bad stories, and everything in between. So tell everyone more about this series and why you felt compelled to produce it and what do you hope that people take away from it? So Podcast Norm, I call them guided storytelling sessions. And the reason they're so important to me is because I actually work with all of the guests before I interview them and basically talk to them about how can we craft your dream interview? Because I want this to be a platform where you can be of service to other people, but also we can be of service to you and you can be of service to yourself. And I think that self-discovery in interviews is like a really big magic piece in, in a conversation where you can guide people to figuring out new things about themselves or even give them the language and help them figure out what they're trying to say or what they feel. So I really wanted to give back that way to the people that I feel like have inspired me and have given to me and to our community. And I wanted to help them and help guide them into telling the story that they dream of telling. This is something that I typically do in general. Like I talk to people about what is the story that you're trying to tell? Um, and so now we're kind of, we have this platform where I can go in any direction I want to go with this or any direction that they want to go with this because I constantly am coming up with different ways to interview people. And I also wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to make this more intentional, put in more work and see how we could make sure that these interviews are, are really like the thing that the guest is always going to reference if you wanna to get to know them. If you wanna to get to know me, listen to this story. And I wanna give people that opportunity. Someone just wrote in the chat and, oh. I think Blair did. This is literally proof that you're completely innovating the interview process and the journalistic process. And Thank there you, are no Blair. truer words. So I thought I'd call that one out. 
I um, appreciate her so much. Your work has also earned you a long list of awards and accolades. Your documentary. Oh, we already, sorry, we already went through that question. Um, so of course it's easy to celebrate the wins, but how do you handle mm. failure or some, when something hasn't worked out for you? Well, that was me creating at your service. <laughs> um, I just build a business. I think when things don't work out, it's really important for us to understand what we have control over and understand what we don't have control over. I have control over the way that I choose to tell stories or the stories that I pick or the way that I'm putting together a deck or the way that I'm pitching something. I don't have control over if someone's gonna green light it or if this agency is going to have the conversation I, I, I want them to have on my behalf or whatever it is. So I wanted to refine what that looked like. And it, it happened through a lot of hardship and pain. And for a while I blamed myself and I thought that I was failing or I did something wrong. Um, and when things don't work out and when things feel like a failure, like one of the panelists said earlier, like it, there is no such thing as failure. It's just, you know, it is perspective and it is a lesson. And what are you gonna make of it? What are you gonna build from it? I'm, I try to be really conscious of having a victim mentality or mindset, especially when I have been told many times throughout my career that nothing, this is just isn't gonna work out for you. It's just not gonna work out for you unless you take that thing off. It's not gonna work out for you unless you look like this or you dress like this or you move here. So once I realize, like I don't have control over other people's opinions of me, but I have control over how hard I work. I took any experience of her, like betrayal or hurt or your typical failure and try to turn it into what's the next step. Amazing. And I, to, to kind of piggyback off of that, that Muslim women are very underrepresented in the media and you've become an inspiration to many who see themselves in you. So what advice do you have for those who are struggling to feel seen and represented within their field? Hmm. It's like pre-advice almost. I don't know why that term just popped into my head. And this is what I wish I would have known and that somebody would have told me. It's important to be seen. Everybody wants to be seen, heard, and valued. But be conscious of what lens you want to be seen through. I struggled for a long time. I mean, up until recently, I think, and I still have to catch myself where I wanted to be seen as good or normal or smart or whatever it was through a very white centric gaze because I felt like that is where the key to the opportunity was or the key to getting something greenlit was or locking this deal is or whatever it is. And I realized that even when I thought I was being myself completely, that I was still always making myself a little bit smaller or a little bit more malleable to fit into a narrative or a box that somebody expected me to fit into. That's a conversation that I wish we would have more internally with our, with our community and externally of who are you doing this for and what is your intention behind it? I try to talk about intention in every piece of work that I do because I think it's really, it's a North star in, in, in how you're going to pursue this. It's the thing you always come back to when you don't know what to do or what the next step is. But if I'm speaking to my community personally and specifically, I would say in this process of wanting to be seen and wanting to be supported, do not forget to support those around you. When you are a part of a marginalized or sub community, Oftentimes we experience this thing called horizontal hostility. And horizontal hostility is when you feel hostility or strangeness with people who are in your community. So an example of this that research was done about is that vegans feel more hostility overall towards vegetarians than non-vegetarians. Because if you're, if you're a vegetarian, then you might as well go the whole way. And I experienced this, we experienced this a lot within our Muslim women community. I mean, any sub community can point this out where 
you're not enough of this. You don't, you, you don't fit into this one specific box that I feel like you should. And we don't just support each other and embrace each other's differences and their individuality and their uniqueness, especially when there typically aren't enough opportunities presented for everyone, especially when corporations or schools or whatever it is are trying to just pick one, just pick one, uh, check off one diversity box. I had this experience that actually I spoke with Blair about years ago um, where I had an agent, my first speaking agent call me one time and say, a Muslim woman, this so-and-so Muslim woman just tried to sign with our agency. And we told them no, because we already have Noor Tagori. And I remember, I mean, I was younger. This is like in the beginning, this is a while ago. And I felt so blown away and confused because it just confirmed to me this scarcity mindset was actually implemented because things were scarce, because opportunities were scarce, because they really did see if you were a part of a sub community that you represented everybody and that one voice was just enough. But they had 60 plus old white men who were former sports coaches on their roster, but they didn't feel the need to diversify in other, in other spaces. So what I would say is beware of that and to continuously try to like, just support each other and be there. And that doesn't mean like you have a responsibility to do X, Y, and Z. You can do your own thing, but just be mindful of the way that we talk about one another. And this is a perfect segue actually into the next question, um, which is how do you wanna see journalism evolve to better champion diversity and inclusion? And what does the future of journalism look like with representation at the forefront? Mm. I mean, I think that way that it will evolve is, you know, I go back and forth with this because I don't know, <laughs> because I do believe that we have to work to build parallel structures. I think in me building out at your service is not to, I'm not gonna start my own network and, and, and create something and just keep it on this channel or whatever. I mean, I guess, although you could say that social media is your own network, but I want to build this new thing from scratch to parallel the current system while we're trying to dismantle it. And I think that, you know, oh, I'm so torn about this because we see like after the BLM movement of last year, how many big corporations had people step down and other people join the board and all of these like very, very, very quick like hires that I know people who are in that, you know, group of people feel it's, it's, it's conflicting because you're like, am I here? Cause I'm checking off this diversity box. Do they even notice my credentials or how credible I like, why didn't they see me before? There are all these questions. So it's, it's really hard. I would say that, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Keep going. I would say that for the future of journalism and storytelling in general, that we are going to have to start supporting more and more independent journalists because, I mean, this can go into a whole other rant, but I think in general, it's really hard to be a, a journalist who works for a media company and makes a decent wage, isn't always terrified of getting laid off. I mean, yesterday or the day before yesterday, HuffPost just laid off a whole bunch of people who weren't expecting it. It's so hard. And so I would tell any young journalist, if you want to be a part of the evolution of journalism, start building your own and building trust with a community because, and that can start, that starts locally, start telling stories in your local communities and start building trust with them because they're the, they're going to be the ones who support you no matter where you go or where you don't go. There are so many different ways that you can uh, start making There's Substack, there's Patreon. Now Twitter is going to be do, doing paid subscriptions. And while that's going to be hard to build, it's still going to be more consistent and it's going to be more authentic to you. Authenticity. I think, you know, there's a role for the storyteller right now. 
um, to reveal kind of all the cracks in the system and to share their experience and their perspective and not necessarily even the answers, but mostly just, you know, all good stories really are questions more so than answers because they're by people. Mm. Um, yeah, I love that. And I also think that good stories provoke good questions for you that they, and they leave you with good questions that you can think about for yourself. Exactly. Um, so one of the things that we admire about you so much is you're not just talking the talk, you're walking the walk. And that's super clear, I think. Um, you started the ICU Foundation with your family to alleviate homelessness in local communities. You talked a little bit about that earlier. Can you give us a little bit more about this organization and, and why you founded it? Yeah, I mean, so all credit goes to my mom. She, um, when I was 12 years old, we were at a convention, an event, and we saw this woman who was dressed in all of these, this like beautiful purple head to toe. Um, and she was selling these beautiful plates that were decorated by women who were survivors of domestic violence, who were living in this shelter that she herself was living in. And my mom felt this connection with her. I remember this conversation. And my mom asked, what do you need? How can we be of service to you? And she had said toiletries. We always get canned foods and people don't realize like we, this is what we need. And she listed out this whole thing. So we started doing these toiletry drives at school when I was in middle school. And it led to doing grocery runs. It led to doing uh, family gift, like food gift cards and grocery gift cards. And we would go to the shelter. It was in Baltimore. We would go to the shelter every couple of weeks and we just, my mom just kept asking how, basically, how can I be of service? What do you need? What do you need? And she now has this roster of families that she serves that, and we found out what people needed. So they make these winter care packages with hygiene kits and family food bags and all of these amazing, uh, just answers to the questions that she was looking for. But it was never officialized until a couple of years ago because my mom, when we were giving out winter care packages, she um, asked this older couple what they needed. And the woman simply responded, we just need to be seen. So my mom created I See You as a response to this woman. And now um, it's a foundation and it's great because now we can do things more official. We were just raising money on social media and stuff and we would just spend it all on, my mom goes to Costco with like five, six carts and she, they have a whole little thing like set up in the house now, but it's amazing. And the reason I share this story is because it's so easy for anybody to do this. People always say like, I wish I could do the work that you all do, you can just, Go find the Pete, like go talk to people, go sit on the ground, have conversations with people and ask them, how can I be of service to you? What do you need? And do, and, and remember that your opportunity of being of service to them is an honor for you. It's like a big deal for you to have that opportunity and we should be chasing more of them. Um, so do what you can. And if you want, I mean, we've posted videos of what we include in our kits and stuff, but anybody can do it. And thank you, Blair, for putting the link to the Instagram. Uh, thanks, follow Blair. ISY Foundation. It's Instagram.com slash ISY Foundation. Um, and it's in the chat of the Zoom. Um, so you've always spoken up for those who can't. Where does that confidence to pursue your own path and not bend into society's expectations and stereotypes come from? Um, and what message do you hope to leave for future generations? I learned, and my mom taught me this, that everybody has shit. Everybody has their own problems. Everybody has their own thing. And it isn't ever worth any of your energy to think about what other people think of you because chances are they're not thinking of you. They have their own things to think about. So why will I ever compromise any part of me because I want to make other people comfortable for something that they're not gonna ever pay attention to. And keeping this in mind has always allowed me to be more confident and more myself in the spaces that I typically wouldn't have been because I can follow my curiosity. I can ask people questions and I won't have to worry about 
if they're going to leave this room and think, wow, that was so odd. That was so weird. That was so whatever, because even if they do, first of all, they're not going to, but if they ever do think about you, it's going to be because you made an impact on them. So why not? And honestly, real talk, it's just, it's just a sigh of relief. It's a sigh of relief when you can just be yourself and walk away from a situation knowing that you weren't wearing a mask. And again, I think if you, what you said earlier, if you approach it from the perspective of how can I be of service to you, what is your intention? If you go in with good intentions mm-hmm. to help that person, you know, hopefully it's, it's perceived that way as well. Yeah. Um, so what is your advice for people listening who admire and aspire to achieve your success in journalism or in activism, mm-hmm. but maybe just don't know where to get started? So For journalism in general, regardless of the medium that you're going to do, if it's radio, if it's television, if it's broadcast, if it's podcast, you have to find your voice. And the way that you do that is through writing. And that means don't try sounding like anybody else. I mean, I've spent tens of thousands of dollars on speaking courses and speaking coaches and vocal coaches and all of whatever, like every penny I saved at points, I would spend towards this because I was struggling to figure out what my voice was when I learned from a mentor that my voice was my voice the whole time. And we just need to learn more about how to tap into it and how to speak with confidence and how to uh, connect with people through that. Nobody wants to hear from a robot. We're tired, like it's, or, or from a script, we're tired of it. And we, people want you to just show up as you. So if you can do that and you can build trust with people, building trust with people, I would say after finding your voice and writing is the, the second biggest thing that you can do. Because when you're able to build trust with people and they know that you're not going to exploit their story or hurt them through their story, then the supply of stories is endless. You can tell as many as you want. And don't look for reassurance because reassurance is futile, especially if we are, if you're on this new path of figuring things out and not doing them in a conventional way, no one is going to have the answers for you except for you. And don't worry about the numbers. Don't worry about how many followers that you have or whatever it is, because that's so volatile. It's not going to stay the same. It's so fluid. And, but you'll never know tomorrow, we're going to have a new app and we're going to have a new, whatever focus on building trust with your core community, the smallest viable audience and, and figure out how to serve those people. Because if you are consistent in how you serve those people and you don't uh, just radically change in a way that doesn't fit your message or your intention anymore, it's going to completely just steer them away. And at the end of the day, that core audience is exactly who you want. A hundred percent. Like you said, it always goes back to intention. Why are you doing this? Those followers could disappear, but you know, your intention of why you're doing it will remain. If you could go back to the beginning of your career with all of the knowledge that you have now, what advice would you give your younger self? It's hard to answer the question, what advice would you give your younger self in the beginning of your career? Because you have to go through all of those things to be where you are. The biggest piece of advice that I would have though is listen to your insides. Listen to the inner voice and what it's telling you and never ever doubt it. Because doubting it is what, makes you lose time and listening to it not only saves you time, but clears your path even more. If there are roadblocks or decisions that you might be insecure about, or you don't know if that's the, if you want to go this way or this way, listening to that person who always will have your back and who will know. And I've discovered that this inner voice is really channeled through your inner child. So like I mentioned earlier, I found all these videos of me as a kid saying, you know, directing my parents in their interviews. And you don't have to have videos of your childhood to just try to meditate on what your younger self, what they were interested in, what they looked like, or what they, um, what they wanted to pursue or what they were curious about building a relationship with that person has been so critical to me, not only having more compassion and grace for myself, but also it is my direct way of connecting with the answers that I'm looking for. It's always there. It's always inside of you. And and I would tell her, just stop trying to look for it and everybody else and stop asking all those people if they think that you'll make it because they don't know. 
And so when they say no, don't let that deter you because they have, they have no idea what's about to happen. And how I'm going off script here, but how do you, I think a lot of people want to tap into that voice, but maybe just don't know how. And especially today, you know, there's so many, so many thoughts and opinions and media and things flowing through us that it's really hard to tap into like what, who that inner child and who you were as a kid and what you were interested in. Yeah. What is your advice? Totally. There's a couple of things that I can say that can help you in that regard of channeling your inner child and connecting with that person. This is uh, something that I learned from an activity that I, uh, that happened in my group of, we're doing the book, the artist's way. I'm and doing that too. someone recommend, oh, yay. I, I love it. It's so amazing. It's so great. Well, the artist's way is really amazing. I love it. Um, so the recommendation was changing your phone screen to a picture of your younger self. So you're always looking at that person. And I love that because when you do that negative self-talk, um, you end up just talking to that younger version of you and that's really detrimental. And so if you can see that person, it's a lot harder for you to do that. The other thing is I do my morning pages every morning. I never thought I would be able to journal. I was always scared to put anything from my insides on paper, even though I'm a writer, but doing my morning pages has actually been the reason that I've been able to connect with this person. And if you aren't familiar with what morning pages are, uh, morning pages are freehand writing three pages every morning. And it's literally the way that Julia Cameron, the author of The Artist's Way describes it is removing a layer of film off the top of the soup and the reason that's so amazing is because it clears your mind. It literally takes away the fogginess. And also whatever you end up writing down, you probably won't think about it again because you finally gave it the space that it needed. So morning pages and just also asking about your younger self. Ask people who knew you when you were young, if you have those people around, ask them like what you were like and what you liked. I, I felt this like urge to paint and I asked my mom if I used to paint when I was young and she was like, yeah, you did. And so I tried to like do the activities that I used to do when I was young. The Artist's Way is a really great book to, to tap into that and build that relationship. It's super interesting that you're reading it. Um, I'm, I'm just on the morning pages section, but yeah, I think I've, I've heard so many great things about it. And that's kind of what I even had in mind when you were talking about, you know, write, writing first with storytelling. Um, yeah. So what's next for you? What's your vision for yourself and your career in 2021 and even beyond? Ooh, um, thank you. Um, right now, so I'm doing, doing a few things. We're working on the podcast nor guided storytelling sessions. I'm also bringing back my live series at your service hour for the third time. Uh, starting Monday. I'm really excited about that. Our first guest is actually in the, in the, in the, the audience. This is what happens when it's virtual. I can't like see people and I can't point them out. Um, Tazine Khan, who is an amazing speaker and uh, cybersecurity researcher. So we're amplifying the women that we love. And uh, I'm also working on an investigative documentary and podcast on the misrepresentation of Muslim Muslims in American media and how that's impacted all of us. And uh, hopefully going to be bringing you all a speaking in public course, the speaking in public course I wish I had uh, sometime this summer. It's super exciting. Keep us posted on everything. Can't wait to see what you're working Thank on. Thank you so much, Drea. Um, so now we're going to close it out with some rapid fire sentence finishers. So nice. three traits that got me where I am today are. Curiosity. Trust. and patience, as hard as that is. Being a rule breaker means? Means listening to your inner voice. A powerful woman I admire is? I, whenever I get asked that question, a million different people <laughs> pop into my brain, but a powerful woman I admire, this isn't one woman, but I will say, all of the women, our mothers and our grandmothers and our great grandmothers who moved from their home countries to a new country 
without knowing the language or having the tools to uh, build the way that they would have in another place and still figured it out and uh, made it okay for all of us. My number one piece of advice for women today is? To remember that the answer is always inside of you, that no one will have a better answer than you will for yourself. And my definition of success is? My definition of success is if I am able to survive while following my curiosity. That's literally all I do is think about everything I'm curious about. And then I just follow in those footsteps. If I can live and do that, then I'm good. You'll never be bored. I'm never, I've never been bored. I've never in my life been bored. I've always been able to make myself, <laughs> make myself entertained. That's a beautiful thing, you know, and I think that, that stems from curiosity. Um, well, thank you so, so much, Nora, for being here today. It was such an incredible conversation, an entire, the entire day of conversation. Um, I'm super inspired by you, the work you're doing, and I'm sure I speak for everyone that's tuning in right now when I say that we can't wait to see what you're doing next. So definitely thank keep you posted. so much. We'll be watching um, and take care. Thank you so much. Thank you all for attending and staying up. If you're not on the, the West Coast, I'm going to go to bed now, but I appreciate all of you. Take care. Bye.